Hi everyone, I'm Jill. And I'm Alice. And this is Waterfront, Waterfront Wednesdays, Wednesdays, brought to you by Boston, Boston Harbor Now. Now. Today we're going to talk about the F word. Excuse me, I thought this was a family-friendly blog. It is. I mean Phil. Oh, Phil, you mean what early Bostonians did around the Shawmut Peninsula to build our modern city. Yes, that kind of the F word for Phil. Great. Phil is important to our work for a few reasons, but first, it's important because Phil Tidelands are governed by Chapter 91, otherwise known as the Public Waterfront Act. And we work with this law often because it protects our rights to access the waterfront. Right, and I think people think about that and they say the right to access a seawall, but it used to be really different. When early Bostonians got here, they found a place that felt kind of more like a beach that's really muddy and icky. There's a lot of tide and there's lots of mud flats and tide lands that stick into the water. Yeah. And the way they dealt with that was to build big piers that stuck out and then to dock their ships at the end of them and walk things back in. Right. And the reason that we don't see those muddy flats is because they gradually filled in those shallow lands to today's present day shoreline, which is mostly made up of seawalls in right. the inner harbor. And the difference between being in the early harbor at high tide and being in our harbor at high tide is it feels a lot more like a river or even a canal, the way things right. come closer together and there's that hard edge. Right. It's narrow, but we dredge, and so it's deep enough that we still get those major tankers coming through. Yep. And so all of these things together are really important because those early settlers were filling in high tide, but their high tide was lower than our high tide. Right. They did pretty well, but they're not mind readers and they couldn't see into the future. So sea level rise and climate change didn't really factor into their calculations. So filled tidelands today are actually pretty vulnerable. Let's talk about where those filled tidelands are. I think we should. So most Bostonians know that the Back Bay was once the Back Bay. Duh. And now it is a neighborhood with nice alphabetized streets. They might not be as aware of how much else of Boston got filled in. And I didn't know this until I was doing some research, but Boston, original Boston, was actually a pretty hilly peninsula, and it was probably about 800 acres wide. So Little Shawmut Peninsula becomes a lot bigger. Totally. Starting with the area around Faneuil Hall. They filled that in first, then later they filled in the area around Quincy Market, then yep. they filled in a couple more iterations until the last seawall that I'm aware of was around 1970 when they built the seawall that now is the edge of Christopher Columbus Park. That's right. And then they also did the area around North Station, or TD Garden, home of the Bruins, which filled in and it turned Mill Pond into Bullfinch Triangle. Right, the Seaport District, also a place of just tide flats. Right. And then they said, let's fill it in, let's build a whole shipping infrastructure there, and there were even rail lines all over that area. Yeah. And then there's East Boston, which was Noddles Island, which explains why the neighborhood is sort of hilly, and then everyone basically knows that Logan was just one giant mud flat. So, if you're looking out over the harbor today, you take it for granted that it hasn't really changed. Because for most people in their lifetime, this is the shape of Boston. True. But I think the part we're at now is talking about how it could be changing in the future. It's not fixed. Right. So if we go back and talk about those early Bostonians, they were building up past their high tide line. But today we know that that is changing very quickly. So how would someone be able to see this contrast? So if you look at a map of the inundation that's projected, or for 2020 flood maps, it actually shrinks our current area right back down, or some areas, right back down to that historic shoreline. So if you look at this map from the city of Boston's Climate Ready Boston Plan, you can see original Shawmut Peninsula and the growth. And then you compare that to this map, and you see that there's a lot of similarities on a neighborhood by neighborhood basis. And that level of flooding is really only acutely obvious when you look at these sort of neighborhood, pockets of neighborhoods that are vulnerable to sea level rise. Hence, projects like Climate Ready East Boston, Charlestown, South Boston, individual projects, and now you can be involved in the Climate Ready Downtown project or the Climate Ready Dorchester project. Right. But in some cases, the waterfront open spaces actually provide a little bit of that natural protection. And so we see those as opportunities to really build that up and create some additional level of resilience for our existing shoreline. Yep, so you might have an open space like Langone and Pueblo Parks in the North End or the vision for Bryan Playground in Charlestown and say, you have this open space and you have a seawall, but you can do some new things there to provide resilience. Or you can take a place like Moakley Park and say, how do we build a park mm -hmm. that does the work itself? So some things can be protected by creating those kinds of strategies, but the reality is that we are going, because of sea level rise, we're gonna see additional lands become submerged, 
and we're gonna expose new lands to tidal flow. So that means that the obligations under Chapter 91 for those waterfront property owners are likely to shift, right? right? So as the mean high watermark kind of moves inland, places that were once landlocked may no longer be landlocked. So if we don't build these resiliency strategies, Parcels that aren't subject to Chapter 91 now could be subject to it in the future. That is a much simpler way of stating it, yes. And there's an additional question about whether we could use new fill into the water to form a barrier of protection. Right, and you hit right on it, right? So we're right now in this very big debate where we're considering how are we going to think about the future of our waterfront regulations in order to adapt for climate change. What we can say is that for sure we are going to be talking a lot about the F word. F as in fill. Yes, F as in Phil. Thanks for tuning in to yet another Waterfront Wednesday. I'm Jill Valdez Horwood. I'm Alice Brown. You can follow us at Harbor Horwood or at Fairy Fairy. And if you like this video, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and throw us a like. Or add some comments below. What are your thoughts on Phil? Or what would you like to see on a future Waterfront Wednesday? We'll see you on the Phil Tideland. <laughs> <laughs>